I'm going to be talking about entropy, not about entropy really, about how, how entropy is used to generate dynamical models. Uh, I am a physicist. Uh, I'm going to talk about quantum mechanics. Um, when trying to figure out the title for this talk, at the first, I was very honest, entropic dynamics, how dynamics is generated by an entropy. Uh, and then, then I saw John Skilling's talk, and I thought I would use another title. Uh, but let me first start by reassuring everybody here that I do not disagree with him, all right? Just because I just say exactly the opposite, you could say, well, for some definition of weird, we both agree. Uh, quantum mechanics is very weird if your intuition is based on classical mechanics. The mathematics of quantum mechanics is actually not weird at all. It's uh, linear algebra. So the issue is, is, is one of it's a conceptual understanding of what quantum mechanics is all about. Uh, but then I thought there would be, for, for people who are not physicists, uh, it would be another title would be it perhaps even more interesting, Mechanics Without Mechanism. The, the idea is that when we do physics, we try to explain what's going on with elementary particles, or we try to explain what's going on at the micro level in order to build up models for what happens at the macro level. Well, if you're doing, trying to do the dynamics for almost anything else, like a social system or a brain or whatever, or an economic system, uh, there are micro variables, that's true, but you have absolutely no idea what they're doing. If in order to explain economics, you have to have a complete, complete theory, theory of what happens in the neurons of an agent, you're in deep trouble. Uh, in the same way, if in order to do physics, you have to really know what's going on with the quarks. You're also in deep trouble because you, 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 we don't have a good theory or at least not a theory we can compute with from there. So it's very interesting to try to come up with a theory of dynamics without really knowing what's going on underneath. This is where models of this type could actually be of interest to people who are not physicists. This is an example for physics, it's true. But, inspired by this type of philosophy, you could apply this kind of uh, modeling to, to a variety of systems. So, let's start. Uh, first, acknowledgments to, oops, oops, no, that's not what I wanted, press the wrong button. Uh, uh, these are current students, uh, or previous students, and then a bunch of people here who have shaped my understanding of entropy and about probability and about what really matters in science um, in a variety of ways. Although it is true that some of these folks over here have really asked questions that really uh, embarrass me periodically. Uh, very good. So, this is the question. Do the laws of physics reflect the laws of nature? Y you have probably noticed, those of you who are not physicists, that uh, physicists are kind of arrogant people who claim to have the fundamental theories of everything, and everybody else is working on details. Well, the question that I want to ask is, is, is really, is, is, is that true? Or are the rules, are physics, laws of nature, uh, rules for processing information about nature? So our objective, of course, I, I favor the latter, the second version, the more modest version, although, although there is nothing modest in what I'm saying here, uh, I, I rather favor the latter. Uh, our goal is to derive quantum theory. Will I succeed? Well, let us be honest, for, from, from, from the very beginning, yes and no. Nein sin, nein no. Muito pelo contrario. Let's be honest about it. I will succeed in deriving pieces of quantum mechanics. In my next talk tomorrow, I will add important pieces to the understanding of quantum mechanics. You're never really done. Whenever, whenever you try to understand a system, uh, you can understand part of the behavior of that system, and then you say, well, what if this system also does blah, 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 and you add a few more things. So the goal is to understand quantum theory as entropic dynamics, and it's a process and to discuss implications for the theory of time, for quantum measurement, for Hilbert spaces, and so on. What else can we understand? So, in quantum mechanics, <coughs> there is 
Even those of you who don't know anything about quantum mechanics, you know that there is a serious problem about interpretation. Are we talking about particles? Are we talking about fields? Uh, are we talking about um, many worlds? Is the cat dead or is it alive? This is, these are the serious problems of quantum mechanics. And it has to do with the issue of once you have the mathematics, how do you interpret it? <coughs> so once you have a mathematical formalism for quantum mechanics, and this is the historical way in which the subject developed, someone came up with Schrodinger's equation, what does it mean? Uh, once you have the formalism, you can try to, by some process of divine inspiration, come up with interpretations. And there are many interpretations of quantum mechanics, Copenhagen interpretation, many worlds, the Bohmian interpretation, and so on. Uh, but there is an alternative. And this is the alternative I favor because it's the one that matches the theory of inference or the theory of probability much more closely. You start with interpretation. You start with a clear idea of what it is you're talking about. Not easy, but that's a starting point. Am I talking about particles? Yes. Let's start from there and proceed, proceed and see where that goes. So it's much better, in my opinion, to start with a clear idea of a subject matter, what you're talking about. From there, you do inference. We know the rules of inference very well. It's probability theory. Bayesian probability theory is the preferred one, although there are like 40,000 versions of Bayesianism. Uh, at, least, at least one. Well, it's probably better than the others. <coughs> and entropic methods. So by processes of inference, you try to build a model of inference uh, on that subject matter. And you come up with possible different formalisms <coughs> depending on various assumptions that you're making, like what is the information that is relevant to this problem. Depending on your choices of what might be relevant pieces of information, you can come up with different models. Now you say, is this any better than that? You have many possibilities, you have many possibilities. Well, actually, it is much better because at this level, you do have experiment. And the experiment actually allows you to figure out if the formalism, which of these uh, pieces of information on which you are basing your, your inference, which are the pieces of information that actually are relevant to your problem? Which are the knobs in your experimental piece of equipment that actually make a difference? So we're going to do the latter and see where that leads. So here is my one slide summary of entropic inference. We're talking about probabilities. This is a space of all possible probability distributions that uh, might be relevant to your problem. It's an, it's obviously, it's a super infinite dimensional space. Uh, this is the prior. That's interesting. I have no problem with starting with a prior. You start with a prior and you update a posterior. Is that a serious problem? What do you pick for the prior? What do you pick for the prior? Uh, it's interesting that that's a problem in physics that was solved by Newton in 1687. Uh, in physics, we call that the problem of the initial conditions. You give me a law of, law of motion and an initial condition, and I will tell you how the system evolves. Now, for some weird reason, everybody worries about choosing the priors in statistics and probability theory, but nobody ever in physics worries about choosing the initial condition. Pick one, keep going. You must have started from somewhere. So this is an initial condition for our state of knowledge. Then, somehow, from some, some things, your grandmother comes and tells you, no, you dummy, you shouldn't believe that. You should believe a probability distribution in this region here. That's not the best one. The, any one of these is going to be much better. That's a constraint. It tells you what probability distributions are better. Uh, of course, you still have the problem of picking one from here, right? Oh, and by the way, this is the information. The information is the constraint. In this approach, I never have to worry about amount of information. Just I have to update from here to somewhere in there. How do I update from here to somewhere in there? Well, here we use an idea originally proposed by John Skilling that seems at first completely trivial, but like all great ideas, it's highly non-trivial. 
It's that, well, if you're going to pick a probability distribution somewhere in here, you better just rank probability distributions according to some desirable criteria, rank them, and so, so, so in this situation, the idea is that the best, if you had no information, would be this one here, and then the ranking according to preference decays exponentially uh, in some form as you go away from there. And when you reach those probability distributions that apparently my grandmother tells me are much better, you're supposed to pick the one that has maximum entropy. So, and this is where I think that John's contribution to the subject is really, really the most crucial one. It's telling us why we ought to maximize something, why we have a variational principle in the first place. Sharon Johnson invented a variational principle. Let us assume that there is a variational principle. With John's idea, it becomes clear that you need a variational principle, not because it's a, form, a part of nature, but because it's a matter of designing a scheme for reasoning in, with incomplete information. So you're supposed to maximize something subject to the information available, subject to appropriate constraints. Very good. Oh, you know, James, James, it's true, the, the really, really important part. I'm just referring to, to this, uh, why we maximize. And, and the idea is ranking. Ed James never became independ independent from the idea of measuring amounts of information. And this business of just ranking is absolutely crucial because we no longer need to think of amount of information. That's great because if you don't have to use those words, you're not making a mistake. Think about that. If you keep your mouth shut, you're not saying any nonsense. There is a value in being quiet every now and then. Anyway, let's go. Uh, so this justifies why we maximize something. Uh, please also notice that this is a relative entropy, and this is another place where Shannon and James uh, didn't quite go right. It's a relative entropy. This is a prior, and that is possibly the family of posteriors. Rank, uh, let's keep going. That is the posterior that is preferred because it has maximum entropy while still being subject to the constraints. And now we can keep going and we can ask, but wait a minute, wait a minute, if you are very, very close here, isn't it true that these guys have almost the same entropy? Are you really going to discard those probability distributions that lie so close? Well, you can ask, how wrong am I going to be if I pick something there? What is the probability that I might have picked something there? and still be okay. Well, the same method, maximum entropy, allows you to tackle that, and it turns out that the probability of being landing there is actually exponential in the entropy, in the ranking, and so really it decays exponentially as you go there. So what this allows you to do is not only to figure out the maximum, but also get some measure of fluctuations or reliability around the maximum, which is, for, oh, by the way, yes, the first guy to write a formula like that was Einstein. So this is the Einstein uh, formula for fluctuations in thermodynamics. Of course, he got it on the basis of just being brilliant uh, uh, and, and in, uh, used his intuition. And so this, this formula has an incredible amount of history. This was the formula that was used by Einstein 1903 to 1905, published in 1905 to provide the first experimental verification for the existence of atoms. Shit, that's deep, right? Right? It's, 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 that was his theory of diffusion, it's a theory of Brownian motion, and everything I'm going to be saying here is really one form or another of Brownian motion. Uh, so this approach includes Maxent, it includes Bayes' rule as a special case. This is very nice. This is very important for quantum mechanics. This fact that you can include both maximum entropy and Bayes' rule in the same picture. And the theory of large deviations is also included to a special cases. So there, that's the one slide. The subject matter, quantum mechanics. So I start with an assumption about what I'm talking about. Uh, there is the world. The world is big. There is the subject matter that interests me, for example, particles or fields. I'm going to be talking about particles here, but we have developed the subject for field theories as well. So, the world is big. We're interested in a, sub, in a part, in a subset of the world. But quite clearly, there is other junk out there too. Other relevant variables that 
other variables that might be relevant to your system. So the goal is to predict the positions of particles. Oh, by the way, this is not about ultimate reality. This is a model. The idea of physics that I have is that this is like a map. When you have the map of the subway of New York City and there is a red line in the map, that doesn't mean that there is a red line in reality. You could draw the red line in red or in green. It would make any difference. You could even draw it in dashed, in points, and make it look discrete. It doesn't make any difference. They're models. If they're useful, we keep them. If they're not, we toss them away. So this is a model of what of something, and in this model, particles have real positions. So here we go, particles have definite, but unknown positions. So definite positions is, is, is so that we can talk about our probabilities. It's crucial, positions are there. But this is complete disagreement with the standard version of quantum mechanics that tells you that particles do not have definite positions, do not have definite momentum, do not have definite energy, unless you measure it. So, in the standard quantum mechanics, the definite position is not the definite position of the particle, it's a definite position of the detector that detected the particle. It's a different animal. Here, the particles have definite positions, uh, but there exist other variables out there in the world that might be relevant. And in this case, the crucial thing is that the probabilities of these other variables, the Y variables, and I'm not going to be telling you much about them, the probabilities of these other variables depend on the positions of the particles. That's the main assumption in this whole, whole business. Fortunately, I don't have to tell you much about the Y variables, which is nice. And of course, the, very, the entropy of these Y variables, that's what's going to matter. Uh, the entropy of these Y variables is just entropy, relative entropy, relative to some uh, underlying measure. And, and the reason I write this is because really, we're going to be playing with that entropy a lot, not with any of the stuff that's here. And this is why this is called entropic dynamics. It's the dynamics of these variables, the stock market, given the fact that there exist other variables, uh, neurons, somewhere's brain, in some, some people's brain or something, that may affect the stock market. We know nothing about these guys, but we may want to include their influence in some way. Technical words. In quantum mechanics, people use the term uh, variables that you do not observe. They call them hidden variables. These are not hidden variables. The technical meaning of the term hidden variables in quantum mechanics is that you want to make your theory look like classical mechanics at some point, and, and this doesn't do that. This is completely different. So the positions are unknown. And so this immediately tells you that your theory is going to be talking about the probabilities of those x's. So the whole theory, the objective, is to find out those probabilities. But here we have another quantity, then this entropy, and this will morph into the phase of the wave function. This is going to give you the magnitude of the wave function. This is going to be the phase of the wave function. And so right in this slide here, we are telling you why it is that you need two basic functions to describe quantum mechanics. Eventually, they will be described by a single complex wave function. Uh, but you need two kinds of variables there. Very good. So here goes the dynamics. The dynamics for one particle happens in three dimensions. For n particles, is three n dimensions. So I'm going to describe the whole system by x. This is the configuration space and has three n dimensions. Uh, associated to that x, there is, of course, the probability of those y variables. And to each x, there is a probability distribution of the y's. So what we have here for the y variables, really, or for the distributions, is a statistical manifold. That will come in handy in a little while. Very good. That's the basic dynamical law. In classical mechanics, as you all know, a particle that is not subject to any forces will move at constant speeds, right? Forever. Move in a straight line at constant speeds. Have you noticed how you never ask why that is so? Aristotle would never have bought that. It's a major, major leap in physics to say, you do not need to explain why it is that a free particle keeps moving at constant speed. It does. 
Well, here in entropic dynamics, we do not need to explain why motion happens. It does. Our goal is not to explain why it happens, but can you make any smart predictions about how it will happen? Can you figure out the probability of the jumps? Of course, the y variables, the, their distribution also jumps to a new one. So no, no, you notice how, how I'm talking so much about x's and y's, right? What that tells me is that the real universe of this course here is x, y, not just x. So here we go, entropic dynamics. We're going to ma maximize the joint entropy. So we have to figure out the joint probability distributions. That's how we figure out how things happen. Uh, we have a prior there. What's the prior? Well, the basic prior I'm going to use, and, and it's, it's, it doesn't matter, OK? Because of how I'm going to formulate it, it doesn't matter what I put there. I'm going to put uniform. But uniform here, as you'll see in a second, it, it doesn't matter. Not, yes? Uh, let me see if I can do that. Oh, it's because it's, uh, it, it is, it is uh, very good, very good. Uh, in a second, these are the new values of y. When, what, what, okay, that, that, that's a, it's a very good notational point that you're making here. When I jump from x to x prime, this refers to the x's now, and these are the x's a little bit later. later. So you could imagine it's a new set of variables in the same space. Same thing here. Uh, if I were to eliminate the prime, uh, it, it would make no difference, of course. But I would like to, 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 to have a notation that tells me that this is now and this is mm, a little bit later. It's the same, it's the same wise. But the, the, I'm talking a little bit later. Very good. So that's uniform. And for that one, what constraints do we put there? This is the crucial thing. This is where the physics is coming in. I'm going to start by using the product rule and separating this into two pieces and then telling you what each one of them is going to be like. OK, so here we go. Use the product rule, and we write this as a product. The first one is probability of x prime given x. Yes, this is what we want to compute. The rest, I'm making an assumption here, namely that the probability of y now depends on the probability of x, on, on the value of x now, and not on the previous value. So this is an assumption here. What the assumption is essentially that as I jump on that statistical manifold, I remain within the statistical manifold. Now I'm doing something interesting here that may be novel to, to some people. Normally when you maximize entropy, you maximize entropy with constraints on moments. On, on the values of expected values, right, right, of, of expectations. Here I'm putting a constraint that's not of that form. I'm telling you uh, the, the, a particular shape of a probability distribution, but not that it is in the form of an expected value or a variance or whatever, right? So this is generalizing, uh, the, the not really generalizing, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's applying the method of maximum entropy in a, in a somewhat unusual way in which the constraints do not come in the form of expected values. But then, of course, we have to put some constraints on that jump, on how particles jump. And so now I'm going to use physics. Now, remember, if you were to try to use this kind of philosophy to come up with models to do, say, uh, I don't know, the stock market, or to do economics, or to do social systems, or to do brains, or, or whatever, this is where you're going to have to change the stuff, because I'm picking constraints that are good for physics. The first constraint that we're going to do for physics here is that say that motion is continuous. The particles move continuously. Now, the amazing thing about saying that a particle moves continuously is that in order to go from here to there, it must have gone through intermediate steps. And so what saying that the motion is continuous means is that you can analyze a big step in terms of little steps. I only need to worry about infinitesimally small steps, and then I iterate the procedure to create a step that's large. The first person to think along those lines was Newton when he came up with the notion that 
In order to describe motion in classical mechanics, you use differential equations. You do not need to know the whole orbit at once. You just need to know where the next position is going to be. So I'm doing something similar here. This is telling you that my equations are going to be differential equations, right? Right? Uh, and I only need to know small changes in order to figure out large changes. Very good. So we're going to consider short steps. And this is the main constraint that is going to implement that the steps are short. I'm going to say that the square of the distance traveled in one step is just a very small number. I'm going to take that small number to 0 at some point so that everything will turn into derivatives at some point. Uh, I'm also using standard notation in geometry because, of course, these theories can be generalized in a variety of ways to include geometries in which repeated indices are being summed over. So this is just Pythagoras' theorem. Take the average and uh, put that to a, small, uh, in, to a small number. There are n constraints of this type, one for each particle. So as far as this, this, theory, uh, uh, this process of inference is concerned, the short steps treat the particles as being independent variables. But of course, uh, the, mo the fact that this guy is, is sort of like fooling around in there means that uh, there will be all sorts of correlations between the particles, as you'll see in a second. You maximize, and you have the probability of the transition for a small step. Uh, this is the effect of those y variables. It's just a matter of substituting it. There is much to it. There is, for each particle, this is the constraint. And there is a Lagrange multiplier for each. And we're going to study what happens uh, in the limit in which this alpha goes to infinity. So that the contribution, you're going to get zero probability unless this is also very small, short steps. You can see that there is a minus sign there. So, so this, in the limit, as alpha goes to infinity, this becomes like a delta function, very short. It's a Gaussian, actually, very, very short. And that's why it didn't matter what prior I was using. The constraints really only probe a very, very tiny region. Very good. S is the entropy of the y variables. So you also see that the particle is going to try to move. The system is going to try to move but it's going to tend to drift in a direction that increases the entropy of the y variables. So that's, this is one entropic dynamics. You're trying to climb that entropy hill. So if you analyze this distribution, it, it, because this is large, this is a Gaussian. It's very simple. A displacement, A, capital A, will refer to both the particle and the coordinate, x, y, z. Uh, that's a clever way of writing it. A general displacement is going to be an expected value plus a fluctuation. The expected value is essentially something that's going along the gradient of the entropy. The fluctuations are just mm, spherically symmetric fluctuations. Very simple. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a linear process. Uh, but there is something very interesting here already, uh, which is the fact that uh, let me see. Yes. Very significant. Uh, if you look at the actual displacement, it's of the order of 1 over alpha. While if you look at the fluctuations, it's of the order, there are two of them here, right? Square. The fluctuations go to alpha to the minus 1 half, the square root. So what that means, if this is 1 over a million, this is only 1 over a thousand. So the fluctuations are enormous. In the limit of large alpha, the fluctuations completely dominate the motion of the particle. So this is exactly what you expect in a Brownian motion, where the fluctuations are enormous, and there is a very, very gradual and, and, and small drift. So what this tells you is that the trajectories are going to be continuous, yes, but also non-differentiable. And this is where, yeah, this is not classical mechanics. This is a mess, right? The these particles are doing some kind of Brownian motion. If you know the position of the particle, you have no idea what the velocity is going to be. There is no tangent to the trajectory. So quantum mechanics is very weird. Anyway, the theory of inference includes no reference to the notion of time. So we have to be very careful here what we mean by time. This is the kind of place where you can go wrong. So there are plenty of assumptions here. What we mean by time in, in physics. Uh, if you're in the stock market, time is very easy. 
It's the time every morning when the bank opens, right? There is an external notion of time. If, you, if, you, if you're doing physics, it's a little bit more complicated because you say time is what a clock measures. And then you're in trouble because you say, oh, what do you mean by a clock? Isn't a clock a system that's supposed to be ruled by exactly the same sort of equations, right? Aren't atomic clocks run on the basis of atoms? And this is the theory of atoms. So wouldn't it be circular to say, I'm using a clock? How do you know that your system, your measuring device, is a clock and not a thermometer? Because your grandmother told you, right? You were brainwashed in school to say, oh, no, that's a clock. That's a thermometer. That's not trivial. In classical physics, the clock is a free particle. It's an idealization, of course, but a clock is a free particle. The free particle moves in a straight line, and it goes equal distances, equal times. You might think that the clock is a pendulum. Ah, that's, that comes later. It's a free particle. I'll say more about that in a, in a second. Uh, in entropic dynamics, time is a bookkeeping device designed to keep track of the accumulation of many small changes. We have one short steps. Now we have to iterate this process many times. So there are three ingredients to inventing a notion of time. One is you have to introduce the notion of an instant. What do you mean by an instant? Then you must argue that those instants are ordered in some way, that there is a later and there is an earlier. And finally, you must introduce some notion of a measure of an interval between two successive instants. You have to introduce a notion of duration. So how do we go here? Really, the foundation of the notion of time is the dynamics. In order to have clocks, you have to recognize that the clocks are physical systems too. Entropic time is the notion of time that we invent in this theory of inference. And we say time is introduced to keep track of the accumulation of small changes. When you have jumped a lot, you do not know what x is. And definitely, you do not know what the next x prime is going to be. So I'm going to start by saying there is a joint probability distribution for what x is and what the next x prime is. And if I marginalize the x, I get the new probabilities for the x primes. Use the product rule. And here we, oops, 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 oops. Ooh. Wait a minute. There we go. OK. Here. Uh, there we go. Here we are. Use the product rule. The, the button for the laser is too close for the, to the button for the, for the switching. Anyway, uh, do something like that. Now, please notice, this is just probability theory. There is absolutely nothing here of physics. This is true always. There are no assumptions there. Period. No quantum probabilities, no chapman kolmogorov equation, no, 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 nothing, none of that. This is just the Finetti, if you like it, Cox, if you like it better. But that's all there is to it. Very good. Now, now we're going to make an assumption. Here's the assumption. If this probability distribution refers to the possible values of x at one instant in time, I'm defining what instant is, right? Then I'm going to say, that is the probability distribution at the next instant of time. Uh, and this is the probability, because this is the probability of jumping. So I'm going to rewrite that. I'm going to introduce the notion of an instant by design, saying if this is the probability distribution at time t for x, then we jump, and then this is the probability distribution at the next instant. Notice what I have done here. I have not assumed this is a Markov process. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm using an equation like this to create the notion of time instant by instant. It's not like I'm assuming that given the present, the future is independent of the past. What I'm telling you is given the present, I'm creating the future. It's a, it's a subtle trick here, but it's important. Uh, very good. Yes. Uh, in this, since I am, yes, 
even in special relativity or in general relativity, you can get away with a parametrization of time for which this is true. Yes. Yeah. Ten minutes. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay. Here we go. So that's one instant. That's the next. Repeat. Okay. So here we go. That's the basic dynamical equation. You can, you can order. Oh, it's clear that those instants are ordered, right? I computed. Uh, and therefore, there is an error of time. You see, the reason is that if you were to throw to go, go backwards in time, you would have to flip those two around, and those two are not the same. In fact, the proper rule to do those, to, to flip these variables around, is to use Bayes' theorem. And, and this is where the error of time enters here. If this piece here is given by the method of maximum entropy, well, then this one is not, because it includes that extra part there. So this kind of physics automatically tells you that this arrow, this time, entropic time, goes forward. So now, how about the interval between the instants? The foundation of any notion of time, again, is the dynamics. So we're going to invent time so that motion looks simple. That's universal in physics. You construct time so that motion is simple. Now, in this kind of theory, this kind of dynamics, the dynamics is dominated for large alpha by the fluctuations. So I'm going to look at the fluctuations, and I'm going, I realize here that the dynamics is controlled by the Lagrange multiplier. So I'm going to define time through the Lagrange multiplier. Here it is. What I'm saying here is that the Lagrange multiplier will have, well, will be inversely proportional to delta t. I'm defining delta t so that the same delta t here applies to all particles. Notice also that what I'm saying here is that the passage of time is the same everywhere. On the right-hand side, there is no x. Time here flows at the same rate as time there. In the same way, there is no t here, there is a delta t, so time on Monday happens at the same rate as time on Tuesday. So I am using here the symmetry properties of non-relativistic uh, physics. So I'm trying to reproduce here Newtonian time. Can we do it differently? Yes, we can. Make it more complicated there. You can get other, other forms of time for relativity. Very good. Uh, instead of writing this constant like that, I'm going to write it as an M, and then some constant there that just changes the units. Why do I do this? I put it there. And at this point, you see, you just have that constant, you have delta t, and this is two remarks that one can make. First, in classical physics, time is defined so that the particle moves equal distances equal time. And uh, second, uh, eventually this m will turn into the mass of the particles, and so you see here that fluctuations are regulated by this parameter here. Mass, in this theory, is a measure of the fluctuations of the particles. So it gives you an insight what mass actually is. By the way, this idea of what mass is, is rela being related to particles, uh, to fluctuations, is exactly the kind of idea that you also get from the Higgs mechanism in quantum field theory. So it's consistent with that. Yes, Kevin? Oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the fluctuations, in the, uh, with respect to the fluctuations, yes. Now, of course, if you want to do this for curved spaces and all of that, then you have to modify that, right? So, so that the idea is it becomes clear where we're making the assumptions and where we can actually generalize to do general relativity. Or, and we have done some of those things. Oh, that, that comes later. The fluctuations, the fluctuations are like this. The fact that the fact that there is a wall there and the particle cannot be inside the wall, that will take care of that in a second. So here we go. We have the basic dynamical equation. Now it's, a, it's a, an integral equation and we can write it in differential form. The equation in differential form takes the form of a, pro, an equation for the conservation, local conservation of probability, that's a divergence. This is a velocity of the probability flow. You compute what that is from this equation here and the fact that we know what that, that transition probability is. And you get an expression that looks like mv is the gradient of phi. If this looks like hamilton jacobi theory, it's because it's precisely what it is, but now deduced from a very different direction. Uh, that m that appears there 
is called the mass tensor. The masses of the particles appear there. And that phi, that tells you how the velocity of the probability flow, what the velocity of the probability flow is, that phi uh, it has the entropy of the y variables, and it has a diffusive component that comes from the fact that this guy included quadratic terms, that, from the fact that this is a Brownian motion eventually. So this is the phi. This will morph into the phase of the wave function. Eta is just keeping track of units. If you want your time to be measured in seconds, you pick the right eta. Very good, here we go. Now, this is what we have at this point. The particle moves to each x, there is an entropy, the particle will diffuse, uh, and uh, yes, this is what you have. If you have a Fokker-Planck equation, you have a diffusion process. This is not quantum mechanics, it's a diffusion process. So, whenever you're doing inference and you get, don't get the result you want, you don't throw the laws of arithmetic. You don't throw them away. You also don't throw the laws of calculus away. My heretical assertion is that you do not throw the laws of probability away either, right? You do not invent quantum probabilities. Bayesians have problems with frequentists, right? right? Physicists have problems with quantum probability. We don't need that. Anyway, this is standard diffusion, it's not quantum mechanics, so we have to change something. So the solution is we allow the statistical manifold to become dynamic. We allow it to depend on time as well. We relax some of the constraints that we had before, we make them, we change the constraints. That's the solution when you're doing inference. And so here you have something interesting because it's clear that we're talking about particles and it starts to become clear that we're talking about waves too. And then the probability distribution will look something like this. The diffusion, when you allow the statistical manifold to become dynamical, We'll have bumps and then we'll have minima and maxima. And it's a little bit like diffusion on a waterbed, right? You're going to have all sorts of things going on. The particular criterion for how to pick the dynamics of these guys here is, uh, is, is inspired by an idea of Edward Nelson, uh, a mathematician, Princeton, who, who thought of coming up with a notion of a non dissipative diffusion. You impose that there is a quantity that is conserved. So you invent a quantity, and you invent it appropriately for different theories, invent a quantity that is conserved. We want to invent it in such a way that the, the functional derivative, the gradient, of, so, so to speak, in phi space of this guy, reproduces the Fokker-Planck equation. And if we do that, it's and, and, and it's just a matter of integration. There is, there is no assumption here. You just say, look, I invent this quantity, uh, so that to, as to reproduce the, the Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, no problem, integrate to find out what this H is. You integrate, you have something like this with some integration constant. Interesting, this starts looking very much like kinetic energies in physics. So what is that? We'll come back to that in a second. So impose energy conservation. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you impose that this H is conserved, you have the derivative with respect to phi, dt d phi, derivative with respect to rho, d rho dt, and impose that equal to zero. But we know that this is the Fokker-Planck equation. So you factor out those guys, and if you impose that this conservation of this mm, energy, mm, let's call it energy, the conservation of this is guaranteed, no matter what the initial conditions for your problem were, you're forced to conclude that you have to update those entropies in such a way that this is true. And so these are the two basic equations of motion. Fokker-Planck coming from maximum entropy and this from the constraints. They're Hamilton's equations. So now you see how it is that the basic equations in physics can be derived purely from inferential purposes. One coming from updating entropies and the other for what are the constraints that you want to impose on those updating entropies? The duality that appears in physics constantly is the probability distribution you want and what information you're going to apply to it. Conclusion. Hamilton's equations are derived from inference. From there you get Poisson brackets, symplectic structure, you get a whole lot of physics. You can get, write these equations in the form of an action. Not fundamental at all, it's just a neat way of writing it. Uh, so we have that equation, we have that. I'm, I'm, I'm about to run out of time, but there is one, 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 one thing I have to get. Do you have the, the Fokker-Planck equation? 
you have the, this equation here that looks like a hamilton jacobi equation. And if, what do I pick for that integration constant? If I pick the simplest possible thing with a potential that answers Kevin's question, uh, then you can actually introduce classical uh, interactions. This is very exactly the hamilton jacobi equation of classical mechanics. It's an indeterministic classical mechanics, but it's uh, not weird at all. Not weird at all. Now, how do we pick that information, that f? We're going to use information geometry here. Use the fischer rao metric for probability distributions. And here we have two families of probability distributions. And therefore, we can write down two of the forms of, of the metric in these spaces. One of them is actually, happens to be proportional to the mass tensor when you substitute in that formula there. The other one is something like this, where rho, you can write it like that. Uh, I'm going too fast for understanding. It's just I want to impress upon you that there is a criterion that's purely inferential that allows me to pick what that f is going to be. And of course, the most simplest structure that we can invent is the contraction of the two, which is a scalar, so, which is a formula like that. So that's what I'm going to pick. I'm going to say the Hamiltonian for my theory is going to be something that reproduces the Fokker-Planck equation and something else that includes potentials, and it includes a purely inferential piece with a constant here that just calibrates the strength of the two contributions. Then we're done. OK, almost finished. Ah, almost finished. We have those are the equations of motion. This is quantum mechanics. You can always combine them into a wave function, where that h that appears there, Planck's constant, is just a rewriting of this quantity here. If I do that, I get quantum mechanics. So, conclusions. Entropic dynamics allows me to derive equations that look like physics. Quantum mechanics is a non-dissipative diffusion in configuration space. It's a Brownian motion, a fancy, sophisticated Brownian motion. There is no need for frequentist probabilities and no need for quantum probabilities. The T in the loss of physics is time. It's a Schrodinger equation that you use to calibrate clocks. So that's what clocks measure, measure the T entropic time. The M that appears in the loss of physics is mass. The Schrodinger equation is also used to calibrate balances and devices to measure mass. Physi position is real in this theory. Other observables are not. They are really created by the act of measurement. Anyway, I didn't get to talk about that one, but it's there. Uh, let me conclude. I have derived something that looks very, very much like quantum mechanics, but we have to be maximally honest in dealing with the subject and say, no, I have cheated. I have not introduced charged particles. If you look around in the world, all the particles carry a charge. I have not talked about charge. So this is not the particles that exist in the real world. Also, they have not spin. I haven't introduced spin. Real particles have spin. So this is a step in the right direction. In the next talk tomorrow, I'll talk for 20 minutes, not more, uh, about how we introduce electric charge on these particles and improve my version of quantum mechanics one step. Thank you very much.